we are setting our relationships on course for smooth sailing and sunny skies. Jay likes my jokes, our ships, relationships. You guys That's get great. it, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a corny kind of funny. Okay, so we used to go sailing with Jay's grandpa when we were in high school and we were dating, and we got some pictures we'll throw up on the screens for you. Oh. We would go in the Thousand Islands region. Yep, and we'd go with some other boats, yep. a group of like, I don't know, five to ten retired guys, and then us. <laughs> there we by are putting the, a cover the youngest, on, a, yes. on a sail. Yep. Really talented. There's some more boats. Nice. And we so, called ourselves the trailer sailors. We did. It's true. Because all those boats can be trailered. So. And it rhymes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Corny. So there's, <laughs> there's this rule in sailing where when you're going down a channel and there's like this big freighter and a little tiny sailboat, the more maneuverable boat chooses to get out of the way. Because, I mean, when you're a big freighter, it takes a long time to turn, okay? You're going to run people over. So the more maneuverable ship it chooses to move out of the way. And Jay has a story for us. Yes, and in the St. Lawrence, where we would do some of the sailing, in between the islands, the shipping channels were very narrow. Uh, but the average freighter size that was passing through there was 700 feet in comparison to a 25 to 32 foot sailboat. So you could imagine anytime one of those came around, we steered very clear of it. But so we 700 were, feet, that's like bigger than this room? Uh, yes, quite, sailboat quite a like lot. Sailboat is like smaller than this stage? Yes, quite a bit. Perfect. Continue. <laughs> uh, and so that particular day we had set out and there was no wind. So all of the boats have a motor on the back that's outboard motor. And they're uh, small. They're only 15 horsepower or whatever. But in that group, How they're fast can you go? probably only seven or eight miles an hour. Woo! It's not like a power boat where you can crank up the 50 horse and just go puttering along yeah so no wind. yes so we're just making way and um in this group there are other engineers and my grandfather was an engineer so he always fabricated things tried to fix things and some of the guys on the trip thought they could fix absolutely anything that was on their boat including their motor and one guy in particular had a eight horsepower like 1955 something or other that was built and rebuilt and rebuilt and he had an antique yes it was, it was a legit antique that seems safe yes and so we're going down the channel against the current and all of a sudden we hear over the radio Tabber J Tabber J this is Sam Piper over and we're like oh uh Sam Piper this is Tabber J over uh, my motor's dead and that's all we heard like all radio etiquette went out the window very quickly and so we're like he needs help He's just dead in the water, but then when we turn around to look at him, because he was behind everybody, um, there is a freighter about like a mile, mile and a half behind him coming down the channel, and it is fully loaded, so it's not stopping, and he immediately begins going to work. We tell him we're on our way to come back to get him. On our way back to get him, he's tearing this thing apart. He's got the cover off of it. Um, He's trying everything. He was panicked, and in the panic, as we're kind of like coming around to come alongside him and get him, uh, the the freighter starts honking its horn at him, and it, that just leads to more stress. And <laughs> and he just panics and takes a, a can, a Folgers can of gasoline, and just throws it at the motor. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> And then decides to fire it up, and it took off like a fireball and everything. It took off for at least, it was only long enough to get him out of the channel, and, but he didn't escape the wake. And so like the whole thing is just, everything's everywhere. He was so frustrated. He was like, just tow me back to the marina. I'm done for this week. I will be back next year. He sold that boat. He sold that motor. Came back next year with a whole new outfit and a uh, much happier person. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Jay. I love that. The more maneuverable ship gives way to the less maneuverable one. This is a good rule of thumb in relationships too and that's what we're going to be talking about today i know i had mentioned we were going to hit singleness we're going to do that another week but today's message applies to all of our relationships friendships family love life tell the person next to you this message is for you and then say this message is for me some of you are really elbowing the people next to you i hope that's your spouse 
be nice to them. You want to take them out to lunch later. All right. Today's talk is called Fight Right. We don't want to fight to be right. We like being right. I like being right. You guys like being right? Yes. yes. No, we want to fight right. There's a right way to fight that can bring reconciliation and restoration, and then there's just a wrong way that just pushes you apart. If you're in any sort of relationship with another person, there will be times when you disagree because neither one of you is perfect, neither one of you is Jesus, and you're different people. But we can let Jesus transform our relationships by learning his ways for healthy discussions. So we're going to look at Matthew 5, 23. Jesus says, if you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Wow. So Jesus is like, hey, if you're driving to Hope Church and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about an offense that someone else has against you, you need to reach out to that person. You need to text that person. You need to go to that person, make things right with them, and then come and worship God. The Holy Spirit could be speaking to you right now about somebody that you need to go to. Maybe it's an old offense that you haven't thought about in a long time. He has a way of bringing things up at the exact time you need to deal with them. You might be thinking, yeah, but isn't it their problem? Like, it's their problem with me. I don't have a problem with them. That's true. But if you're surrendered to the Holy Spirit because you've trusted in Jesus and you're listening to his voice for your navigational course, then you're the more maneuverable ship. Jesus continued in verse 24. He says, or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you'll likely end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. Jesus is saying it benefits you to make the first move because sometimes people refuse to move. It's like if those two boats just both kept on the same course, the, the freighter would have run over the sailboat. Somebody has got to choose to move. So when you're talking to someone and you know that you're right and they're wrong, but they won't move, we've got to be the smaller boat. We've got to be the bigger person. We've got to move to the side and let them pass by. Otherwise, we're going to have a crash. And that's not good for anyone. I can think of moments in our marriage where we were at an impasse and we were both so right, but somebody has to choose to serve the other person and apologize first. And what happens usually is that when we do that, then the other person responds in humility with an apology, but somebody's got to choose to go first. Or there are times in my work life, I remember when I used to work at the police academy, where my boss, she was always right, and she was really good at her job. She had done it for many years, and I was just a college student. I don't really know what I was doing. But there were times when I knew she was wrong, but I chose to submit under her authority. I chose to be the more maneuverable ship. And in that, God taught me a lot of character things. Somebody's got to yield to avoid a crash. Somebody's got to make the first move. And if you know Jesus, that someone is you. And I know that's hard to do, but we're going to talk through it together. Proverbs 19, 11 says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. It's to your glory. It's to your credit to overlook an offense. How does that work? The Bible says those who have been forgiven much love much. We can overlook someone's offenses because Jesus went before us before we ever did anything right or wrong. He covered our offenses with his blood so that when we trust in Jesus, God overlooks our offenses and we can overlook other people's offenses too. I love it. It's an overflow. It's like the parable Jesus told about the guy who was forgiven a debt of $100,000. He's like, whoa, I could have never paid that back. That's amazing. Thank you so much. He goes scot-free. He sees someone who owes him money. He's like, that guy owes me 10 bucks. You know what? Put him in jail. Wow. The grace of God that went above and beyond to cover our debts, it empowers us to extend grace to other people. God gives us grace to give it away. It's an overflow. 
It's an overflow. That thing at work, that problem you have where maybe somebody stole your idea or they stole credit, let it go. Let it go. God will promote you. Come on, he's your provider. You don't have to be best friends with that person. In fact, I don't think it would be wise to do that. But it is wise to overlook their offense. The comments that your parents made growing up, you're too this, you're too that, you're not enough this, not enough that. Why can't you be like him or her? Why do you look that way? All those hurtful things that were said, let them go. Look at what God says about you because that's the truth of who you are. Your spouse's flaws, maybe they have a lot of annoying quirks that were cute when you were dating, but now they're like just really rubbing you the wrong way. Maybe they throw their clothes at the hamper and they're like next to it on the floor, but not in it. Let those little things go. Give them grace. We're going to talk about the big things in just a bit. For, for the little things, let it go. At XO, I loved it. One of the speakers was saying he keeps a list of things that he wants to talk to his wife about, things that she did that makes him upset. And they talk about these things once a week. And, you know, he's making a list all week and then he pulls it out on the designated day. He looks at it and he's like, what was I upset about? I don't even know. I don't remember. These things weren't even that big of a deal. And they realize by the time they get to talking about them, they only have a couple things that they want to look at. Most of the time, the things that offend us, they're better to overlook. Even the things that we might say are really big offenses, you know, those people probably don't even know that they hurt you. But Jesus understands. And here's what he said at the cross in Luke 23, 34. He says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Sometimes we think, oh, they know what they're doing. But I would say more often than not, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how it hurt you. They don't know how it affected you. I find myself saying it a lot. So-and-so said such and such about me, and I could choose to be angry, and sometimes I am. But it's better for me to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, and my heart is free and I keep sailing around, enjoying my life, staying on the course that God has for me, not getting shipwrecked. Let it go. Now, there are some things that we shouldn't overlook. There are some things, in order to have healthy relationships, we got to talk about them. In those situations, Jesus says, go to the person who offends you. Matthew 18, 15, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. I love how he says, if someone hurts you, because it's inevitable. Somebody's going to hurt you. And that's okay. He says, go to them. You have permission. Go to them. Don't go to somebody else and talk about them. Don't go to a whole group of people. Get them on your team and then talk about them. No, no, no. Just go to the person who offended you. Sometimes we miss this simple step because maybe growing up, you saw your parents talk about people rather than to them. Maybe you never saw conflict resolved. Everything was just left hanging. Maybe fighting was the only way that people gave each other attention in your family. Or maybe your parents avoided each other. Maybe one person always won and one always lost. Whatever that imprint was, that environment you grew up in, it, it contributed to how you love other people. It created a navigational blueprint for you that now you look at relationships with. Our attachment style is the navigational chart and it's what we developed as children we're going to discover our attachment styles at family night on march 8th at 6 30 p.m i hope you can come to that we'll put the qr code on the screen for you so you can sign up but we talked a little bit about attachment styles week one of this series if you missed it you can go listen for more detail i'm just gonna uh, recap them a little bit each combination of attachment styles fights in a predictable way so when you know your tendency you can take ownership of it. So the first attachment style is avoiders. I'm an avoider, and what we tend to do is not look at emotions, avoid feelings, avoid emotional connections. And when we're fighting, we tend to separate ourselves from other people. We tend to want to be alone, tend to want to process by ourselves and not have a close connection. Jeremiah 6.14 says, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. If you're an avoider, you need to look at your emotions. Choose to share them. Ask for help when you feel like retreating. Push yourself to talk not just about facts, 
but about feelings. If you're an avoider, you might have gone your whole life just talking about facts because it was never modeled for you. No one ever comforted you. I'm saying with Jesus, it's time to look at your feelings. It's time to look at your humanity and who God made you to be. Don't leave anything on the table. Embrace everything he has for you. Feelings are how we connect and how we find common ground with other people. They're a really good thing. As an avoider, it's easy for me to focus on facts when my husband and I are fighting. We both have facts that we go back and forth with, but I've learned that it's better to connect over feelings. My eight-year-old daughter is also an avoider. Uh, you see, we tend to pass these things on to our children. And so the other day, my son was bugging her. He's five. You know, little brothers tend to bug their sisters. And she was just frustrated. And I found her in her room withdrawing from the family and she's reading her Bible I look over her shoulder it says where to find help when you're angry and I said are you feeling angry right now she's like yes I'm like well that's really good that you're looking for help from God I love that let's talk about your feelings why are you feeling angry well he won't stop poking me and it's annoying and it's so funny because her brother, he just wants to connect to her. That's why he's poking her and picking on her. He loves her. He's not showing it in a way that she can receive it. And so we went and talked to him and said, hey, when you do this, it makes her feel angry. And they were able to then resolve it and play together. But that's why we want to talk about our feelings and not just be like, oh, you're just avoiding the family. No, no, no. We want to talk about those things. Are there any, any avoiders out there in the house? You feel like that's you? I tend to retreat. Yes. A few of you maybe are avoiding participating. That's okay too. <laughs> the second attachment style is pleasers. They try to keep the people around them happy. And they do whatever it takes to avoid conflict. Keep the peace. And they'll even lie about their emotions. I know you guys would never lie, but sometimes in order to keep the peace, we feel like it's a good thing to do. Pleasers tend to say they don't have any problems or repress their feelings, but what happens is they end up resenting other people. Ephesians 4.25, if you're a pleaser, this is for you, says what this adds up to then is this, no more lies, no more pretense, tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. When you lie to others, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. If you're a pleaser, you need to practice being honest first with yourself and then with other people about your emotions. You have valid needs that other people want to meet if you'll let them. I have a friend who's a pleaser and he said when he and his wife disagree, he just says as little as possible. Any pleasers in the house? Yeah. That's okay, there's one more style. It's called vacillators, and it's a combination of the two, where we push people away, and yet we also pull them in. We avoid them, and yet we also want to keep the peace and please them and connect with them. For vacillators, they usually uh, struggle with unmet expectations. If you're going to fight with somebody, it's probably about that, because you idealize situations. You have great expectations and great dreams, and they're good things, but what happens is, you probably don't communicate them. And other people, they disappoint you. They miss the mark. They're not what you thought they would be. And this can look like you respond with frustration or anger. And the whole time, the other people might be like, I don't even know you had any expectations. But what you're actually feeling is sadness. Last week, I was at the playground with my kids. And my son, who is five, he's a vacillator. And we're playing. And he starts walking away from the playground. All like this, you know. Like, buddy, is something wrong? He's like, this day is not meeting my expectations. I'm like, wow, that is such a vacillator thing to say. Thank you for being honest. Why isn't it meeting your expectations? What are you feeling? He's like, well, I'm feeling sad. I'm like, why are you feeling sad, buddy? Well, my sister keeps playing on the monkey bars and I feel like she's going to fall and that makes me scared and then I feel anxious about it and I don't want her to get hurt so I'm just going to go away from the playground so I don't have to see it. I'm like, thank you for sharing your feelings. 
My gosh, so many times in parenting, I think we miss steps of asking kids what they're feeling. Because I could have just been like, stop throwing a tantrum. Why are you going away from the playground? But we want to pause and say, what are you feeling? And in that moment, we were able to then talk to his sister and say, when you do this, I feel unsafe. And we were able to reassure him. Mom's right here to spot her. If she falls, I'm going to do my best to catch her. And we were able to continue on with our day. If you're a vacillator, I love your expectations. You got to communicate those things with other people. And you may need to take some of them down a notch because human beings will disappoint you. God will never disappoint you, but people will. There's an example of a vacillator husband and wife in Song of Solomon. If you've never read this book, you should read it. It's really interesting for relationships. Chapter 5, verse 2, the wife says, I was sound asleep. Ah. <sighs> In my dreams, I was wide awake. Oh, listen, it's the sound of my lover knocking, calling. So she's sleeping. He's knocking. Hey, baby. She's like, oh, I'm awake now. The husband says, let me in, dear companion, dearest friend, my dove, my lover. I'm soaked with the dampness of the night, drenched with dew, shivering and cold. The woman, but I'm in my nightgown. You expect me to get dressed? Like, you're all sweaty. I'm bathed and in bed. You want me to get dirty? She's like, ah, you know what, I have a headache. You know what, I'm all ready for bed. You know, what? I have a lot of reasons to not connect with you. Verse four, my lover wouldn't take no for an answer and the longer he knocked, the more excited I became. Okay, she's coming around to his idea. I got up to open the door to my lover, sweetly ready to receive him, desiring and expectant as I turned the door handle. When I opened the door, he was gone. My loved one had tired of waiting and left, and I died inside. I felt so bad. I ran out looking for him. He was nowhere to be found. So by the end of this story, they both had the same goal. They're like, I want to connect with my spouse. But there was missed expectations. By the time the wife comes around, the husband's like, I'm not interested anymore. So he's disappointed, and then she's disappointed. The thing is, most of the time, especially in marriage, we want the same things as our loved ones. But we fight over our different approaches. My husband's a vacillator. I'm an avoider. And so when you put those attachment styles together, there's a fight circle that is very predictable. That's right. If you're married, you have a predictable fight pattern that you might have never realized. But once you see the pattern, you can break the cycle. And this is a cycle that will keep happening until one of you decides to break it. Because here's the thing. As a vacillator, my husband has great expectations that are usually happening in his head. And I don't find out about them until I haven't met some of the expectations, until he's disappointed. And then my normal pattern would, to be, would be to detach and be like, okay, well, you didn't tell me about those things, so I'm just going to go keep focusing on my day and not connecting with you. And then we just keep going in this cycle of misconnections. But the thing is, when our attachment styles cause us to detach, we want to get out of that cycle. So for my husband, he could say, I have some expectations. I want to communicate with you. Or he could let his expectations go. For myself, I could break the cycle by not detaching. I could break the cycle by asking him about his feelings more often. Because I'm an avoider, I tend not to do that. But I'm learning how to ask him those things to help get his expectations communicated. You have a core fight pattern in all of your close relationships. That fight you continually have with your mom, your friend, your husband, your wife, it's the same thing. But Jesus helps us break the cycle because he broke the power of sin in our lives. Come on. So it's kind of like sailing. If you keep the rudder one way, you're, you're just going to sail in a circle. But once you see like, oh, I'm going in circles, you can turn it. You can change course, and then you can go in a new direction. Whichever person in the relationship recognizes the pattern, that's the more maneuverable boat because you're listening to and responding to the Holy Spirit. So that person, they go first in charting a new course. And sometimes it's me, sometimes it's Jay. Honestly, it's whoever is more surrendered to the Holy Spirit in the moment. And here's what it looks like. It's called the comfort circle. No matter your relationship, whether it's a mother-daughter, father-son, friend-to-friend, co-worker-to-co-worker, married people, it starts with picking one issue to discuss. 
And it's so simple, but I think we really complicate this. We're like, I've got all these problems with you and they've been building up a long time and you always and you never. We wanna stay away from words like that because that is looking at too many things to talk about. Just one thing, keep it simple. You can talk about those other things for your next conversation, but just one thing. Remember, the point of fighting is to gain understanding, not for there to be a winner or a loser. So the first step is pick one issue and then ask your person, is now a good time to talk about this issue? Because the thing is, some of us are slower processors and that's okay. We might not be ready to talk about our emotions. So you wanna ask your person, is now a good time? And if it's not, you wanna schedule a different time. Like now's not a good time, but let's talk about it tonight. Let's talk about it tomorrow morning. You wanna schedule a time to talk about it. And then you present the issue using I statements. When you do this, I feel this. You know, if we look at our Song of Solomon example, when you stay in bed, I feel rejected. I feel disappointed. Whatever the thing is, when you do this, I feel that. If someone comes to you with an issue, it's your job to be the listener. And your step is step two, listen. Listen, even if they're completely wrong. Listen, even if they don't have their facts straight. Resist the urge to volley back and forth or to bring up past hurts. It's very easy to be like, well, you said I did this, well, you did that to me, and that's why I did that to you. And it doesn't solve anything. We start a fight cycle. We wanna listen. Instead of fighting to be right, which puts you against the other person, we wanna fight right. We wanna be on the same team and have the same goal. Because if when one of us wins, somebody's losing. And there are no losers in our relationships because we care about people. In our marriages, two people become one. So if you win but your spouse loses, you just lost. In our friendships with other believers, we're all part of the body of Christ. So if you lose and they win, the whole body, we lose together. Your friends who don't know Jesus, if you win and they lose, man, that's a big loss. We wanna prioritize loving people over being right. We're here to make a difference, not to make a point. Proverbs says that fools air their own opinions. Wise people seek understanding. It's possible to understand someone and not agree with them. When someone else is expressing their feelings, remember, it's not your turn to bring up your feelings. That time will come. You want to listen to understand. Point three is to empathize. Their feelings are true to them, so you want to validate them, which that word validate means to make legally valid. They're coming to you because they want someone to say, I see your feelings. I see why you could feel that way. I understand you. And what you're doing, you're acknowledging their humanity, their feelings seen. Proverbs says the tongue of the wise brings healing. I want to bring healing. You know, people wanted to be around Jesus because he made them feel loved. He helped them find healing, not because he made them feel wrong. The Pharisees did that. In the safety of love, with Jesus, people could work out their issues. And we want to do the same thing. If you're the listener, the next step is to ask questions. Point four, ask questions. If, especially if the speaker doesn't talk about their feelings, you really wanna to get to the feelings. That's the most important thing. So you wanna say, how does that make you feel? Proverbs 25 says, the plan in a man's heart is like water in a deep well, but a man of understanding gets it out. I love this verse. People of understanding, they help draw things out of people so they can find healing. So if you're talking to somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm sad, that's a really good start. But you want to help them get to the specific feeling. That's a very general feeling. But maybe instead of sad, they mean, I feel belittled or I feel unloved. When you know what the actual thing is, then you can speak to that issue. And if that's hard for you, that's okay. You can get out a list of feeling words. We're going to put one on the screen. You can take a picture of it with your cell phone. Or if you're watching at home, just do a screenshot of it. You don't have to read this whole thing now. But later, when you're trying to figure out feelings... Take this list out. It's so helpful. My husband and I use this all the time. And yeah, it's awkward at first for us to pause and be like, oh, uh, let's go get that feeling word list out. But it is so worth it. So worth it. And once you identify your feelings, then you can ask questions around those things. You can say, have you felt this feeling before? 
Do I make you feel this way often? Maybe you felt this way as a child. If you felt this in your childhood, did you form beliefs around God or other people or relationships? That's going to help you gain understanding. This is where you're asking them to see their navigational chart. And you're helping them to plot a new course with what God says. With his truth as their navigational markers. And this brings us to our last step for the listener. Number five, resolve. Resolve. We want to bring resolution. And how do we do that? We ask, what do you need? You can't meet a need if you don't know what it is. What are they looking for help with? Begin with the end in mind, basically. And we're going to put up a list of ways that you can resolve an argument. Ways that you can resolve a discussion. Problem solving is the first one. I think most of us stop here. We're like, I can solve all your problems. Tell me problems. But that's not always what we're looking for. That's one. Ownership is another. Maybe you're like, I just need you to take ownership and admit that there's a problem here. Maybe you're looking for an apology. You're like, can you please acknowledge this pain, these feelings that you caused and say, I'm sorry? Maybe you just want to get it off your chest. You're talking to your loved one about something that happened in your day, not to gossip, not to complain about someone else, but to say, I'm going to let this thing go. Maybe you need reassurance. You're looking for someone to tell you it's going to be okay. This is a big one with our kids. Maybe you want someone to say, Despite all those things, I still love you. Looking for reassurance or compromise. Maybe you're at an impasse and you want to work something out or comfort. Sometimes the best thing you can do for someone is just to comfort them, to give them a hug, to hold them. When you've done all those things and the speaker is satisfied, they feel heard, they feel valued, they feel loved, you feel connected to each other, then it's time to switch roles. And it's your turn to share what you're feeling and your problem and for them to listen. And often we're not taught to do this, but if we can learn how to do this, if we can push past our imprint and learn how to connect with those we love, we'll have such thriving, passionate, peaceful relationships. Jay and I did this with a couple regarding their finances a few weeks ago and they both had the same end goal which was they wanted to get a mortgage but they had two different ways of doing it one wanted to borrow this amount less than what they needed one wanted to borrow more than what they needed and it sounds like they're arguing facts so we're like what are the feelings why do you want to do this and why do you want to do this and we found out that one of the people they had a childhood where their family was bad with money and they had a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress around going into debt. And they're like, I do not want to be my father. Their spouse had no idea. For the other person, they had been late on some bills and they felt unsafe if they didn't have enough money in their savings account. This person had no idea they felt unsafe. And so you take those two emotions and now we understand each other. And now we can serve each other. And now we can reassure each other and say it's going to be okay. And then look at the option and say, what is the best choice to serve these needs? And sometimes it's not real easy. Like in that moment, we're looking for compromise, but we encourage them to go pray together, to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to them, to work out the numbers and see what's the better option for both of them to benefit. Because especially when we're married, we're on the same team. There are no winners, there's no losers. There's just understanding, which brings us closer together. You can do this with your kids too. You can do it at work, wherever you have relationships and experience conflict. You're gonna pick one issue, listen, empathize, ask questions, resolve it, and then let the other person go. Let them have their turn. We wanna replace our fight cycle with our comfort circle then we all have opportunities to walk in freedom because every day things will come against us where we could be offended. My gosh, I had opportunities to be offended today. The key is to live offense-free, to be the more maneuverable boat, to be like Jesus. Make the first move. Overlook offenses and walk in freedom. And when you can't overlook those things, go to the person who offended you and work out those differences. 
Have awareness of your attachment style and your tendency. Take ownership of those things and break that fight cycle with the comfort circle. The good news of Jesus is the story of a rupture and then a repaired relationship. If you think about it, all of humanity in the very beginning, we enjoyed a beautiful relationship with God in the Garden of Eden, and there was peace, and there was joy, and there was love, and there was no pain, no sickness. We just got to walk with our Father every day. And then we didn't trust Him. And there came a point where we ate of a tree He told us not to eat of, because on that day you eat of it, you experience good and evil evil and we were not meant to experience evil but we made this choice and that decision had consequences and he had to kick us out of the garden of eden because he's like i don't want you to eat of the tree of life because then you'll live forever in this broken state and you're hurting and i'm your father and i love you and i want that for you and so for hundreds of years people had to sacrifice bulls and goats to try to to make atonement for any place that they fell short so that they could have a restored relationship with God. And only priests could approach God at certain times, under certain conditions. And it was a temporary solution for an eternal problem. But God made the first move. He did what we could not. He sent a part of himself in his son, Jesus. And Jesus lived a perfect life. He was a perfect, eternal sacrifice once and for all to cleanse our sins. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. While we were his enemies, the Bible says, Jesus was beaten for us because he loves us. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that gave us peace, it was put on him. He did all the work so that we could rest in a relationship with him, so that we could have that closeness that we had in the Garden of Eden, so that we could experience his Holy Spirit daily with us, the part of God who is everywhere all at once, the way God originally intended it for us. He did all of that. He made the first move. The next move is up to us. Maybe he's been speaking to you today about someone you need to go to who has a problem with you. I know, it's not your problem, it's their problem. But he's saying if someone has an offense, go to them, make amends. You're the smaller boat, it's okay. Maybe you need to overlook an offense. There's something you can't talk about with someone or there's something that's just been festering and it's small and God's saying you need to let it go. You need to forgive so you can be free. Maybe you need to go to someone who's offended you and you need to work things out. You make the first move. You text them today. Set up a time to meet. Maybe you need to talk to your spouse about their feelings. Maybe you've never actually talked about your feelings together. That's okay. You can use the comfort circle today and start experiencing that closeness that God wants you to experience. Or maybe today is the day that you trust in Jesus. You know, everything that's happened in your life up to this point, God has seen it. He's been with you. He's been wooing you. He's been pursuing you. He brought you here today for a reason, and that's because he wants to love you. He wants to cover over your sins with the blood of Jesus.